Welcome to the Generation Presentation, brought to you by Justin Warden of First Baptist Student Ministry in Albertville, Alabama. As you probably know, there have been many generations that have populated our earth over the last several decades. Their names include the GI generation, those born between 1900 and 1925, the builders or silent generation, those born between 1925 and 1945, followed by the baby boomers because of the increase in birth rates, those born between 1945 and 1963, followed by the baby busters or Generation X because of the decrease in birth rates, those born between 1963 and 1982. Then you've got the millennials or the mosaics, those born between 1982 to 2002. And then of course the latest, those born since 2002, known as Generation Z. This presentation will do three things over the next 10 minutes or so. First, we're gonna define the three most recent generations, X, Y, and Z, and describe their differences. Then we'll discuss three important cultural issues affecting students and young adults from these three generations as they seek to follow Jesus and live out their faith in Him. And then last, we're going to give several strategies for the church or local ministry to reach out to these three generations on a very practical level. So let's dive into part one, getting to know generations X, Y, and Z. Generation X, first and foremost, is also known as Gen X or the Baby Busters. They don't have very many alternative names and I'll tell you why in a moment. This name, Generation X, was popularized as a name for this group thanks to the 1965 book called Generation X, as well as the 1991 Douglas Copeland book called Generation X Tales for an Accelerated Culture. The X is said to refer to the unknown variable or to a desire not to be defined as those in this generation. They are not very great investors financially, where 60% of Gen X is either not very knowledgeable or not at all knowledgeable about investments and financial products and only 46% contribute regularly to a retirement savings plan. These in that generation are also known as spenders. 82% are homeowners and their homes have an average value of $238,000. Also, all of them, or almost all of them, are on Facebook, which seems to have taken a slight dive in recent generations. 95% have a Facebook page, 35% have LinkedIn profiles, and 25% regularly post on Twitter. Many of Generation X were unsure about their futures at one time. 40% are working in a career they intended when they actually entered into the workforce. When thinking about their values, 12% say Gen X is unique because of their technology use, followed by 11% say it's because of their work ethic, and 7% say it's because of how conservative they are. DanSchwabel.com says this, There are 45 million of them, and they are typically forgotten by the media despite their rising power in the workplace. Before we get to the next generation, some say there may be a mini generation in between this and the next. While this window is only seven years wide, we are a cohort that grew up between two very different cohorts, the Gen Xers and the Millennials. We are the bridge from analog to digital. And for that reason, Woodman, an associate professor of sociology, is now classifying us as Xennials. Let's move on. Next, we've got Generation Y, also known as the Millennials, probably because of the year 2000 reference. They have many names, Generation Y as in W-H-Y. They sure do question everything. They're known as the Internet Generation. Few, if any, remember life before websites or cell phones. They're known as Gen Next. They're always forward-focused in perspective. How about My Pod Generation? Besides the digital music reference, they expect mass customation. Baby Boomlets. Most are the prodigy of the baby boomer generation. Echo boomers, same as the former, with additional reference to wide impact of Gen Y on society. They're known as the boomerang generation. They are returning home after college, still trying to find their way. Generation now, little patience for accepting things the way they are. Or even generation waking up, because they're raising the bar on global sustainability and change. Here's an interesting fact. 39% of millennials have a tattoo, according to Pew Research. And that seems to be becoming more widely accepted in the workplace than ever before. The economy affects them greatly. They have well-defined values and have extremely entrepreneurial spirits. Let's talk about the economy. One trillion dollars in student debt. The employment rate is 16.3% for this generation. And just six in 10 millennials have jobs. Half are part-time, according to Harvard University. 63% know someone who had to move back home because of the economy, and the median salary across Generation Y is about $39,700 a year. Speaking of money, 81% have donated money 
or goods or services, according to Walden University and Harris Interactive. 75% see themselves as authentic and are not willing to compromise their family and personal values. They're on track to become the most educated generation in American history. 44% of millennials say that marriage is becoming obsolete compared to the 35% of boomers who felt that same way. There are those in this generation who are more tolerant of races and groups than any other generation, somewhere between 47% versus former generations, which were about 19%. Additionally, 35% of employed millennials have started their own business on the side to supplement their income. 90% say being an entrepreneur is a mindset instead of a role of a business owner. More than a quarter, 27%, are already self-employed, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and 84% of Gen Y, or millennials, are seeking advice about finance, according to Merrill Lynch. Finally, the new silent generation, or Generation Z, or Gen Z, or iGen, or Centennials, as they're known. Dan Schwabell says this, while they haven't yet entered the workplace, they have a different set of values and beliefs than their predecessors. They were born during the financial meltdown and don't know a world without the internet. They will become the most entrepreneurial, conservative, diverse, and educated generation in the world. Let's talk about their values. 77% of Gen Z are either extremely or very interested in volunteering to gain work experience. 76% are concerned about man's impact on the planet. 90% of them would be upset if they had to give up their internet connection while only 51% would give up eating and 56% would give up downloading music. As students, 55% of Gen Z students say that their parents are putting pressure on them to gain professional experience during high school. 80% of Gen Zs think that they are more driven than their peers, according to intern Sushi. 50% of Gen Z will be university educated compared to the 33% of millennials and 25% of Gen X. They are entrepreneurs. Let's look at that. 72% of Gen Z wants to start a business someday. 71% expect to experience significant failure before achieving success and nearly 40% say they see failure as an opportunity to try again. 38% say that they will invest in something that changes the world according to a Gallup poll. 93% of parents say their Gen Z kids influence family spending decisions and household purchases. And let's talk about investing. Their top financial goals are buying a car, that's 33%, paying for education, that's 23%, and buying a house, that's 20%, according to a survey conducted by Visa. Now that we've come to understand their differences, let's look at their similarities. They all struggle, Gen X, Y, and Z, with leadership, morality, and what is known as the chemical revolution. What does this effect have on their faith in Christ? Welcome to part two where we'll talk about the cultural issues that affect students following Jesus. There's three issues that are seriously affecting all three of these generations in the following ways. First, there's the followership revolution. It's this idea of leadership versus followership as Eric Erickson has described. Each of these generations have a significant percentage who will quickly get behind a cause or support something they believe in strongly. According to the AMA, American Management Association, Generation Xers are often considered the slacker generation. They naturally question authority figures and are responsible for creating the work-life balance concept. Born in a time of declining population growth, this generation of workers possesses strong technical skills and is more independent than the prior generations. Because Gen Xers place a lower priority on work, many company leaders from the baby boomer generation assume these workers are not as dedicated. However, Gen Xers are willing to develop their skill sets and take advantage of challenges and are perceived as very adaptive to job instability in the post downsizing environment. So ultimately, more followers than leaders seem to be prominent in Generation X. Furthermore, Generation Y is known as the first global centric generation, having some or excuse me, having come of age during a rapid growth of the internet and an increase in global terrorism. They are among the most resilient in navigating change while deepening their appreciation for diversity and inclusion. Because of the technology increase and educational availability, this generation will most likely be loaded with leaders more than followers. Lastly, it may be too soon to tell with the current generation of teenagers and young adults, Gen Z, but they are entering the workforce and all signs point to good things. According to Forbes, 
When asked, the millennial and Gen Z survey respondents cited honesty, communication, approachability, confidence, and the willingness to be supportive as the key traits of a good leader. Among Gen Z workers, nearly 84% say they themselves aspired to be leaders, while 79% of millennials said the same. About 60% of the two groups said their leadership aspirations lay within their current company. Second issue we'll discuss is the sexual revolution, which is measured by the greater diversity of moral standards, greater hedonism, decreased capacity and skills for true interpersonal intimacy, and a detachment from the physical and emotional connection. In Generation X, it's been said that most U.S. adults now say it is not necessary to believe in God to be moral or to have good values, 56% up from about half, 49%, who expressed this view in 2011, according to Pew Research Center. When it comes to sexual relationships during this generation, some say the impact of the internet has made a huge impact on privacy and intimacy. However, one impact on the sex life of Generation X women includes the relationship dynamics created between Generation X women, whose earning potential and economic power has increased at the same time the earning expectations of Generation X men has decreased. Millennials are to be the ones to stop global warming, cure cancer, and solve most of the world's other problems. After all, the millennials helped elect Barack Obama, who championed hope and change. And when it comes to morality and sexual purity, it seems to be a thing of the past. According to Relevant Magazine, Seth Shaver says, I think our generation is more relationally minded than principle minded. Shaver adds, sometimes principles get in the way of relationships. We haven't quite figured out how to hold on to our moral priorities and still respect those of others. And our generation wants relationships so badly that sometimes we'll throw everything else out to get it. What about the latest generation, Generation Z? According to psychcentral.com, overall researchers discovered that after barely changing at all during the 1980s and 1990s, acceptance of premarital sex increased from 42% in 2000 to 58% in 2012. Acceptance of same-sex sexual relations more than tripled from 13% in 1990 to 44% in 2012. Growing up not really knowing a time where there's been debate between gay and straight or non-gender specific bathrooms at Target or the whole LGBTQ thing, some theorize that these shifts in sexual attitudes and behavior are linked to the growing cultural individualism in the U.S. When the culture places more emphasis on the needs of the self and less on social rules, more relaxed attitudes towards sexuality are the almost inevitable result. And third issue, the chemical revolution, which includes the use of both illicit and legal drugs, prescription abuse, binge drinking, party games, ADD treatments and meds, steroids, birth control, etc. All chemical. According to drugabuse.com, throughout all four generations, the most recent generations, alcohol has been the most commonly used substance within the past year. At their peak, over 80% of millennials, Gen Xers, and boomers had used alcohol recently. For the boomers, 19 was the age during which alcohol was most frequently consumed, whereas Generation X and millennials peaked at age 22. Marijuana was the second most used drug of all these generations, but as you might expect from the emerging drug culture of the 1960s, boomers stand out from the pack. Boomers, millennials, and Gen Xers all saw their recent marijuana usage peak around ages 18 to 20, but the millennials and Gen Xers show a peak prominence about 30 to 35, and around 50% of boomers in that age group reported using marijuana within the past year. According to the National Institute of Drug Abuse, in December of 2017, a survey was done of the drug use and, of, and attitudes among 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in hundreds of schools across the country continued to report promising trends. Within the past year, use of illicit drugs other than marijuana, holding steady at its lowest levels in over two decades. 5.8% among 8th graders, 9.4% among 10th graders, and only 13.3% among 12th graders. And finally, now that we see the characteristics that define these generations, and we see the significant issues that plague these generations, what can we do as the church or a Christian ministry about it? Welcome to part three, Church and Family Ministry Strategies for Discipleship, where I hope we'll talk about overcoming these issues and obstacles. There are three final words of advice or ministry tactics to help these students and young adults with the ever-evolving issues discussed here. Number one, stop avoiding the topics that matter. Number two, connect students with mentors who can walk with them through this journey. And number three, study up to pray up 
and offer up. So number one, stop avoiding the topics that matter. For too long, churches have avoided topics plaguing our culture such as drug use, sex, and stepping up into leadership roles. Teenagers need to be reminded that the church is aware their generation struggles and they realize that adult generations have struggled with these same things. According to Adolescence Periodical, a study of over 80,000 middle and high school students revealed that parental sanctions against drug use coupled with at least one significant talk about drugs reduces teen drug use. Now we're not talking about the church taking the place of the parents, just empowering the parents and coming alongside of them to help and resource them with books, websites, conferences, accountability, counseling opportunities, or just listening and praying for them. If the church does not speak up about what the Bible has to say about these topics affecting students, the culture and the school system will continue to step up and pro provide their own short-sighted answers. Secondly, we need to connect students with mentors who can walk with them through this journey. One obvious observation in this study of the latest generations is how they have all become more and more self-reliant. Other adults and even parents have become almost unnecessary to many of these students. Although it is unhealthy to see students learning to fend for themselves during this formative time of their teenage years, they need examples. They need godly adults to pour into them. In the new book, Parenting Beyond Your Capacity by Reggie Joyner and Carrie Newhoff, they discuss this issue like this. I, Carrie, always knew there was a passage into manhood that was supposed to take place, but I had no idea how it happened. My son Jordan and I talked about it, and when he turned 13, we set up what we referred to as his mentoring year. Early in the year, we sat down and selected five men in our relational circle that we both knew and felt comfortable with. I approached each man and explained what we were doing. The plan was fairly simple. I asked each mentor to spend one day I asked each mentor to impart one spiritual truth, something faith-based, and I asked them to impart one life truth, just some good advice. I also checked calendars to make sure each mentor could make it for a dinner at my place after the summer was over. Jordan kept a journal over the summer. Five years later, I'm still amazed at the power that experience carried. A wider circle has incredible benefits that run in more directions than we might suspect. It became obvious to me as a pastor that other adults could and should have significant relationships with my kids. Understanding the impact some of those mentors had on my son's lives inspired me to work towards a ministry style that would put weekly mentors in the lives of kids and students. A reminder of how important it is for the church and parents to partner. You see, students need adults. They need connections between older generations and younger. And they need to be made for a student to have a well-rounded view of this world that they are growing up in and inheriting. Lastly, and most importantly, number three, we need to study up, to pray up, and offer up. If we are going to be able to accurately pray for these students and families, as well as adequately offer up the best advice possible, we must study up on the culture they are currently living in. This means as parents, being aware of the latest apps on their iPhones and trends of their friends. As pastors and church leaders, we need to be well-read on the culture and the upcoming generations to know how to best minister to them. This may be as simple as having lunch with students at your church one day, everyone loves free food, or by subscribing to something like the Culture Translator or the Youth Culture Report. For example, we need to realize, according to Walt Mueller's Youth Culture 101 book, the emerging generation of teenagers is the wealthiest in history. So, we need to understand that they need a cause to believe in bigger than themselves as we instill financial responsibility and generosity into these students. Let's do our best to get to know them so we know how to pray for them and know how to offer relevant and well-received advice to them. Study up, to pray up, and offer up. As a conclusion, so whether a student is from Generation X, Y, or Z, Let's get to know these students and the issues that plague their generation and minister to them as best as possible. After all, if we can teach any generation to love God and obey His commandments, then and only then will that generation truly experience God's love. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 10, God says, But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments. Amen and amen.